This video explores a few topics that some people do tend to get a little bit heated about. I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong, I'm just going to share my views and a bit of evidence that I think supports them. You're more than welcome to disagree, and by all means, jump into the comments and we can have a respectful dialogue about it. There's only one exception to that, and I'll get to that at the end of the video. I don't really feel like plants are deeply controversial, and yet, without fail, there are some topics when I am talking plants that will get the comment section to light up and the downvotes to start piling in. And so today I thought it might be interesting to explore four of the deepest controversies that surround the world of cacti. Let's call it Cactus Controversy Corner and have a bit of a deep dive into those issues that really get people hot under the collar. And the first of those deals, of course, with this beautiful plant, Lophophora williamsii, the peyote cactus. Now, without fail, whenever I share this plant on this channel, there are people who want to jump into the comments to remind me of the fact that it is illegal to own one of these. Now, of course, that is true in the United States of America. How and why a plant can be illegal to own in its own native range kind of blows my mind, but it's certainly not illegal to grow here. But first of all, I think if we're gonna understand the crazy legal status of these hallucinogenic plants, we have to understand a little bit about where that moral panic has come from. Of course, these plants have been used for a very long period of time, traditionally, by Native American peoples. The mescaline in them sends you on a bit of a hallucinogenic trip. And that, of course, religiously speaking, is seen as a way of connecting with spiritual concepts. So of course, when North America is colonized by Christian peoples, they're looking for ways to suppress local habits and cultures. And confronting things like mind-altering substances are one of the first go-tos that they decide to clamp down on. Now you combine that with the moral panic around drugs, the war on drugs is what I'm talking about of the mid-20th century, and you have the perfect firestorm for the complete suppression of a natively growing plant that just so happens to have a chemical in it that'll send you on a trip. The end result, of course, is that growing these plants without a specific religious license in the United States is indeed illegal. But that illegality and the strange legal status around this plant extends beyond its native range as well. Down here in Australia, it is legal to own and grow these plants. Unless you live in Queensland, they see the world a little bit differently up there in Queensland. But here's the strange thing. I can grow this plant. I can set seeds of this plant. But if I try to import this plant or import seeds of this plant, I can be charged with the importation of a category one drug. Essentially it'd be the same as if I was importing marijuana. And obviously they're gonna throw the book at me from a legal standpoint. Once the plant's here, once it's in my collection, no dramas whatsoever. And the crazy thing is, that ban on importation extends to other innocent species as well. Lophophora diffuser, which looks a lot like this, but contains no mescaline whatsoever, also utterly illegal to import. How? Why? Who knows? It's just part of the crazy bureaucracy wrapped around a moral panic dealing with the notion of mind-altering substances that occur naturally in our plants. Frankly, I don't know why you'd want to use something as beautiful as this. These plants exist to be beautiful specimens, in my opinion. But it kind of speaks to what happens when people start reacting to the things that grow happily in nature. Bizarre, right? And then, of course, that doesn't even bring in the whole notion of trichocereus, which in themselves also contain mescaline. Just grow them anywhere, who cares? Import the seeds, do what you like. Just don't grow these. Blows my mind, makes no sense. You know it's not controversial? Hitting the subscribe button. There's a lot of you who watch this channel regularly who aren't subscribed. Why not give it a crack? Get this content fed straight into your feed. 
and support the channel at the same time. Anyway, let's look at the next controversy. Now the next controversy I reckon is a little bit more of a political one. There have been times where this channel taking an interest in the world around us and the environment, I've mentioned climate change and the inevitable response is a few people piping up in the comments to say to me, I don't believe in climate change. Now, the science is in. It's very hard to dispute that fact. But even if we're going to defy the notion of human-induced climate change, it's almost impossible not to recognise the fact that our world and its climate is in a constant state of upheaval and has been since day one. The climate is always changing. We've gone through ice ages. We've gone through hot, steamy periods. Whether people are here to change it or otherwise. And the impact on the plants that we love can be witnessed in real time. This is not the species I'm going to talk about, but it's illustrative. This is a copy of power. But the plant that I want to speak about is a particular Copiapoa species called Copiapoa solaris. It grows in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And here's the thing, like all cacti, it's evolved to have a very ideal response to extended dry periods. It can withstand drought without any problem. The succulents in those plants naturally is a fantastic defendant against life in the desert. But the drought currently afflicting the habitat of Copiapoa solaris is so prolonged, so extensive, that plants that are decades, perhaps even centuries old, are just giving up, withering away in the field. You can go into valleys out there and just see plant after plant after plant after plant, huge clumps of them that have just died. And it's all because of an evolving climactic situation, climate change. The plants aren't getting enough precipitation, they're not getting enough water to maintain themselves. These are plants that have evolved to cope with extended periods of drought, still not getting enough water to eke out an existence. And so it is the plight of Copiapoa solaris that is reflective of the broader impact of climate change on our plants. You don't have to believe in it, but all you need to do is look at those dead plants out in habitat. They haven't been developed over, they haven't had a road carved across the top of them. They've just given up. So when you deny climate change, spare a thought for the poor, humble Copiapoa solaris, which is now critically endangered for little other reason other than the fact that it can't cope with the newly developed climate that has settled in its own habitat. The next hot button issue is less political and I suppose a little bit more religious. Um, understandably, talking about plants, talking about how plants end up looking the way that they do. I spend a bit of time talking about evolution on this channel. And again, that notion of evolution always brings out someone to say, I don't believe in evolution. Now that's fine. You don't have to believe in evolution, but we can see evolution even on a small scale reflected in this greenhouse, right? Because evolution is essentially environmental pressures, whether that be an extended drought period, whether that be extended rainfall, some difficulty, some pressure on a plant population, and the plants that are best suited to surviving that, surviving and carrying their genes forward. These two plants here, they are both from the same batch of a species of cacti called Stenocereus benecii. Fantastic plants. They grow with a really thick, dusty, waxy white farina, which essentially is an evolutionary uh, trait to protect them from the harshest sun rays. Kind of like sunscreen, right? Fantastic. Makes them quite a beautiful plant in cultivation. Now I sowed these seeds. They are both from the same batch of seeds. And yet you can look at these two plants and see natural genetic diversity. This particular plant here, even in its infancy, is already developing that nice, thick, white, waxy farina, that sunscreen layer. This plant here, same size, same age, no farina yet. Which of these two plants 
is best suited to surviving in habitat? Undoubtedly, it's this one. And it's this one which is far more likely to reach maturity, to reproduce, and to proliferate its genetic makeup. White plant continues on, green plant more likely to die. That's just evolution on a small scale, even in terms of human selection. If I had to cull some of these plants, naturally I'm picking the ones that have got the unique white trait. Culling the ones that don't. That's selection in action, and you can just see it play out before our very eyes. But at the other end of the scale, we can see evolution that has spanned millennia. All we need to do is look at the euphorbias. Now, this is Euphorbia obesa. It looks nothing like its cousin Euphorbia francoisei. And yet they're both Euphorbias. We know this because we can look at them genetically and see their relationship to each other. But we can also look at them what we call morphologically, which means looking at their physical traits. Both of these plants, when they flower, their flowers look very, very similar. It's what unites them as Euphorbias. Cut them both open, they both bleed white latex sap. Again, common to all the euphorbias. So despite the fact that these two plants look nothing alike, we know that they're quite closely related. The same is true of a euphorbia that grows out of the cracks in the concrete, a weed in our backyard, or a great hulking rubber tree. They're all euphorbias and they're all united by those two morphological traits. Now, this is a very ancient genus of plants. How is it that we can have plants that look so different, spanning the entire globe, all related to each other? Well, it just means that euphorbias evolved at a time when the continents were all collected together. As the continents drifted apart over many, many, many millions of years, you end up with your euphorbias in South Africa, your euphorbias in Madagascar, euphorbias growing natively in Australia, in the Americas, South America, Europe, Asia, they're everywhere. And that's evolution on a grand scale for you. So whether you want to look at it on the big picture or the tiny greenhouse sized picture, to me, it's pretty clear that it's hard to argue against evolution. But maybe that's just me. Now the fourth and final hot button issue that I'm going to explore today is plant poaching. And that is the extraction of plants from their natural habitat to put into our collections. By far this is the most controversial thing that I ever talk about on this channel. I'm guaranteed to get a slew of downvotes and a whole bunch of angry comments every time I mention those words plant poaching. Because there are some people who think it's totally okay. but. Let's for a moment strip back the emotion and look at it purely in practical terms. And we can do that by looking at the genus Conophytum. Humble, beautiful little plants. They look like tiny little rocks out in their habitat in southwestern Africa. And they're related to lithops, delightfully collectible. Here's the problem with the humble Conophytum though. Most of those plants, they live in one location only. For the most part, each species is restricted to one isolated hillside. They're not spread everywhere. And so the impact of plant poaching is acute. In fact, we can look at a couple of species as exemplars of this. For example, Conophytum mirabile. Beautiful little plants, absolutely delightful. You can understand why people want them in their collections. And it is a plant you can find in cultivation. This is a plant species that is now estimated to have only 1,000 plants remaining in habitat. The reason being, 90% of their population has been stripped away from the environment over the past five or six years by plant poachers. Imagine that, a 90% reduction in their population in such a short span of time. It's no wonder that it's now listed as a critically endangered plant. But if you think a thousand plants in habitat's pretty wild, spare a thought for poor old Conophytum crateriform. Now, these are really, really unique plants. That name crateriform means that their plant bodies resemble the shape of a crater. They're kind of 
concave in a way, which makes them very desirable. Again, you can get them in cultivation. There's really no reason to take them from habitat. But at the last time anyone went out to their habitat to count how many of these plants remained, they could only find 23 of them. 23! And the reason for that is the collection of these plants from their native habitat by plant poachers. Not development, not climate change, that is solely as a result of people removing the plants from habitat. So if you want to tell me that plant poaching has no impact on the beautiful plants that we love and adore, you only need to look to the humble conifitum. Now, that's not to say that every single plant that's ever been taken from habitat is as significantly impacted as those. Plant poaching really came into focus most acutely recently with the story of Stephania erecta. Now these are plants, little cordiciform plants that grow with these beautiful little vines. They grow in southeastern Asia and during the lockdowns of the pandemic they became a focus of houseplant collectors because of that beauty. Now here's the thing, it later was revealed that the overwhelming majority, if not all of them, had been stripped straight out of the limestone cliffs of Thailand, straight out of habitat. But these are plants that are not listed as concern at all. They grow like weeds over there. So there hasn't been that significant of an environmental impact. That doesn't mean that it's okay. In fact, I actually think that the story of Stefania erecta and the way that that has built awareness around the dangers of plant poaching is probably quite a positive thing. But when you do know about plant poaching, when you've become educated and you're aware of it and you persist anyway, to me, it becomes a moral issue, a deeply troubling moral issue. And here's why. Because when plants are in habitat, they're available, they're accessible. Anyone like you or I can go out and experience them. They're a shared resource. Everyone has access to them. It's wonderful. And having seen plants in habitat myself, I know what an almost spiritual experience it can be. It's truly a delight. When we take those plants from habitat and we put them into our collection, they're no longer widely accessible. They're gate kept. They are ours and we choose who comes and sees them. And that's totally fine for the plants that we buy, the plants that we raise from seed or cutting, we propagate ourselves. But taking a plant that's widely accessible, making it our own and gatekeeping it, to me, that just speaks to self-entitlement, to selfishness, to a view that we are more important than the collective. And that's why I think this is a deeply troubling moral issue. And if you do disagree with me on this one, well, frankly, I think you're wrong and I'm not really interested in that open dialogue. By all means, tell me I'm wrong. But you're not going to convince me, you're not going to change my mind. And it's because of the story of those conifitums and other critically endangered plants just like them that I see no justification whatsoever for any form of plant poaching. Now that's cactus controversy for you. Now I don't profess to be 100% right on every issue and I'm completely open to constructive dialogue. I don't really engage with abusive comments, but if you've got a different perspective and you want to duke it out in the comments, I am only too open to have that respectful discussion. So please, if you feel differently or if you feel like I'm right, jump into the comments and let me know. I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on any of these four topics. In the meantime though, I'm Michael and this is Arid Zine. I'll catch you next time.